It's a real privilege to be with you here. It's, it's my first visit to Southeast Asia. As you heard, I, I know India very well, but it's the first time I've gone further east. Uh, so it's wonderful to be here. I, I feel I've already made lots of friends in the few days I've been here in the Philippines, and I'm hoping in the next few days I'll, I'll make lots more. It's great being here. Now, I've only got 45 minutes this morning, and sometimes the material that I'm going to present takes me a week. So uh, this is going to be the intensely condensed version. Um, so bear with me if I move very quickly uh, through some of this material as we think of the subject of God's word to the church. And I want to begin with uh, a short story. A few years ago, I had the privilege of visiting Nairobi. Where's Karobia? Right here. Fantastic. It was my, my first visit to Kenya. And um, as many of you may know, Kenya is uh, a very Christian country. More than 70% of the population are church members, I think. They say. And uh, I believe that more people go to church regularly in Kenya than has ever been the case voluntarily in the UK. And yet when I visited Kenya in 1997, and Karobia's comment, they say, maybe illustrates this, I found many Christian leaders in Kenya were saying, if we are such a Christian country, why isn't our country more transformed? And maybe that's a question that many of us can echo from our own contexts. As I was walking around Nairobi, I saw this sign painted on a wall, Jesus Christ is the Lord. And actually, I think I saw more scriptures and verses about Jesus written up than I saw advertising hoardings as I was walking around Nairobi. It was really striking. As I saw that sign, I thought, yeah, for 70% of the people of Kenya, in many ways, Jesus Christ is the Lord. And yet, people are saying, we have so many problems. We have problems of poverty and a great contrast between rich and poor. We have problems of environmental destruction, of wildlife disappearing, of forests going, of erosion, of pollution. We have pro problems of injustice. We have problems of corruption. We have problems of tribalism. And as I looked at that sign, suddenly my eyes kind of widened. And if I put up the next picture, you may be able to see those words, Jesus Christ is the Lord, right in the center. But look at the context. This is the context of the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our 21st century world. A world where more than half of the population of our planet are now urban. A world with immense contrasts between incredible wealth and extreme poverty. A world where we see corruption, we see nationalism and tribalism in different forms, where we see injustice and where we see environmental degradation. And what Kenyan church leaders were saying to me was, if Jesus Christ is going to be Lord at all, then Jesus Christ must be Lord of all. All of this is part of the gospel. All of this is part of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that includes caring for the non-human creation. Jesus Christ must be Lord of our attitude to the environment. I'm not going to spend any time this morning talking about the ecological crises that we face, because many of you here are much more expert on that, and particularly in the Southeast Asian context. We're going to hear more about that. But you all know the issues. They're multiple, and for many people, here in Southeast Asia, they are faced on a daily basis. Actually, they are for those of us who live in the West, but sometimes we're insulated from the immediate effects of those, and so people are sometimes not so aware. What I want to focus on is quite simply the theology. What does the Bible say about this? Some of you will remember from way back in the 70s a book called The Late Great Planet Earth that was popular back then. And for some people, what's the point? of having good news for the late great planet Earth. After all, it's all going to get burned up one day. When Jesus returns, there'll be nothing left. So why bother with creation care? In fact, I find three of the most common excuses that I hear from Christians about why we shouldn't bother with creation care are these. Firstly, evangelism's what's re what really matters. Care for creation is a distraction. We should be saving souls, not saving seals. Secondly, only humans really matter. We alone are made in the image of God. We should be caring for the poor, not caring for porcupines. And thirdly, God will destroy the earth 
environmental eschatology, if you like long words. And so again, why bother care for planet Earth? Well, hopefully, during this talk, I will be addressing each of those as we look at some of what the Bible has to teach on this subject. And I want to introduce, for some of you, maybe a new term, which is the idea of a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift is a change in our way of looking at things, a change of our worldview. Like that happened when Copernicus, the scientist, realized that the Earth wasn't the center of the universe, and that actually the Earth was revolving around the sun, not the sun revolving around the Earth. That was a paradigm shift. It was a massive change in consciousness. And I believe as evangelical Christians, we need a paradigm shift on a similar scale in our attitude to what the Bible teaches on creation. And I can illustrate it from two of the best known bits of the Bible. And these really spoke to me when I began on this journey, maybe nearly 25 years ago. The story of Noah is probably the favorite children's story in the Old Testament. Uh, it's got everything. It's got color. You can learn the colors of the rainbow. You can teach children to count in twos. It's got animals. And like every good children's tale, it has mild threat but a happy ending. So it's very popular. But we often leave the tale of Noah in, in the Sunday school. We often leave it in the kindergarten. We don't tend to think about it much as adults. But the early church saw the story of Noah as an Old Testament paradigm, example of the salvation that Jesus came to bring. And it's a shocking story if you think about it, because just who gets saved? Very few human beings, eight in total, four men, four women. And yet, 14 of many species of wildlife, seven pairs, and at least one pair of every species. Noah is a story of a God who is passionate about biodiversity conservation. And those species are saved not for Noah's sake, not so he can have a nice um, beef rice or a nice pork stew, not so that he has a pet animal to pat on the head in the evening. We're told that God rescued those creatures or told Noah to rescue them simply so that their kind might continue upon the earth. They matter to God. And the rainbow is a sign of God's saving covenant with the whole creation, you and your descendants and every living creature upon the earth. Seven times in the Hebrew of Genesis 9, God refers to his covenant with a non-human creation, even in one verse, my covenant with the earth. So this is an explosive passage for our theology of salvation. And the other verse I want to simply refer to is the best known verse in the whole Bible, John 3:16. God so loved the people that he gave his only son. Now you all go, no, that's not what it says. Although I'm told that in most Chinese translations, of the Bible, it actually says God so loved the people in John 3. Because it's become so deep in the consciousness of many Christians that actually world means people, that that's what we assume. And it was a shock for me as a young theological student many years ago to discover that the Greek word that's used is cosmos. God so loved the cosmos that he sent his only begotten son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. And that was a shock. And I talked to all my lecturers in the college, and I read what the commentaries had to say. And they were quite ambivalent. They were quite undecided. Some of them said, yes, it's true. Both in classical and New Testament Greek, cosmos has the normal meaning of the whole created order. But in this passage, we can't be sure, because it goes on to talk about those who respond, those who believe. And how can a mountain or a flycatcher, or a whale, believe. And okay, we shouldn't build a whole theology of creation care on John 3.16. I don't want to do that. What I want to do is use it as an illustration of how we often miss what's there in the Bible, because we read the Bible as the story of Jesus and me, or Jesus and us. We don't read the Bible as the story of Jesus, of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, and the whole of creation. And that's what I want us to do very quickly this morning. You see, particularly those who have been influenced by the Western theological tradition, and probably at least indirectly that's most of us, 
we've inherited a dualist gospel. This isn't the biblical gospel, this came from Greek philosophy. It came in because the early church found itself in the context of having to answer Greek philosophy. And so it tried to put the gospel in terms that made sense in that culture. That was the right thing to do. But in doing so, it often brought in concepts from Greek culture that were alien to the biblical worldview. And one of those most devastating con concepts that was brought in was the idea that spiritual things are more important than material things. The Bible never teaches that. That there is a separation between this world and the next world. So this is the dualist gospel, that we down here, we have Jesus, and we want to get other Christians to come and join our church, and one day we get taken up to heaven, which is completely separate and completely other and nothing to do with this reality. We actually sang about it in that hymn, Amazing Grace. A verse that I don't think John Newton wrote. I think it was added later. But if you have that dualist gospel, then everything in that box on the right there, not only environment, but where we work, business, politics, art, culture, sport, poverty, medicine, actually all of those are pretty irrelevant because the only thing that matters is saving souls and getting them to heaven. That's the consequence of the dualist worldview. It has deeply infected evangelical thinking, and it's not biblical. What I want to suggest instead, as a more biblical way of looking at things, is this picture here, what I call the kingdom gospel, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And of course, Jesus taught about the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. He used the terms interchangeably. And it starts with the transformation that Jesus Christ alone brings, a transformation that needs to take place in individual human beings. And for us, that's where it starts. It starts with the effects of the cross and resurrection of Jesus on our lives. But it doesn't stop there. The kingdom gospel is like dropping a stone into a pool and the ripples keep going outwards. So transformation, not just of individuals, but of churches. Depending on your church, you may find that hard to believe. It's a transformation, not just of churches, but of communities. Community transformation recognizing that gospel is about addressing issues of justice and of poverty and of accountability and many, many other things. But it's also about a transformation that ripples out into creation. The kingdom of God is creation healed in its widest sense, says a theologian. And I think those are very helpful words. And what I want to do quite quickly is look through the Bible's narrative of hope that includes the whole of creation. Some people think that creation theology all comes from Genesis 1. And I want to say no, it comes from the whole Bible. It's part of the whole Bible's meta-narrative, the big story of God's saving work. And I've often used this scenario here of looking at it as a story in five acts of the drama. The acts being creation, fall, Israel, Jesus, and new creation. I didn't actually make that up. The early church used to use this in summarizing the biblical story. And some of you will know N.T. Wright, Tom Wright, uh, the, the biblical scholar and writer. He uses the same outline. And all I've done is take that outline and try to say, what does this mean for the whole of creation? So let's look at scene one, or act one, a blessed creation. I'm afraid these pictures aren't from Southeast Asia, they're from the Middle East but I chose them because these are all species that may have been familiar to Jesus when he walked this earth. They're all found near to or in Galilee. And as we look at creation, I, just, I could say so much about this, but in this first act, I just want to emphasize four points. Firstly, God made it good. When you woke up this morning, if like me, you opened your curtains and the sun was coming up, the birds were starting to sing, and it felt like this is going to be a lovely day, I hope you said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you brought the sun up again this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your good creation. As we ate food at breakfast on those tables outdoors, I hope you said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the fruits of your creation that bring us health, that are good for us. Thank you for your good world. 
everything that God made is good. And at the end, when Jesus had, when God, well, I say Jesus, but yeah, he was part of it too. God, Jesus, and the Spirit were all at work in creation. When God had finished creating, he stopped and looked at all he had made and said, it's very good. Why the very? Sometimes I've heard preachers say, it's very because humans were added. Before that, it was just good. Humans made it very good. If you look at the text, that's not what it means. It's absolutely clear that the very good refers to the completion. If you like, it's biodiversity that's very good. It's the whole thing. It's all that God has made. And the second critical point is that the earth is the Lord's, as Psalm 24 puts it. It's not our world. We are but tenants, leaseholders, within a world that is God's. That has huge implications. Depending on where you live, there will be people fighting over the land. There will be corporations that say, we want this land, and we want to grow genetically modified crops on it. There will be governments that are saying, we own this land, and indigenous people saying, no, we own this land. And to all of those, God says, no, I own the land. You can use it, you can be leaseholders, but it's mine. Corporations do not own the mineral rights. Governments do not own the seas and the land around their countries. I know there are areas of the oceans near here that are disputed by different countries. Well, actually, it's important for us to remember they belong to God, first and foremost. The earth is the Lord's. And then the other two points I want to emphasize about creation are to do with us and our place within creation. And these two points are two sides of one coin. That humanity is part of creation, not separate, and that humanity is called apart to image God in caring for the earth and its creatures. I believe it's vital we hold those two truths together. They're greatly emphasized, both of them, in Genesis 1 and 2. If we only emphasize one, our worldview becomes deeply, deeply destructive. So if we believe that human humanity is part of creation and not separate, as many secular environmentalists do today, we are just part of nature, why should we intervene? We are the virus species, we are causing the problem. Maybe nature would be better off without us. It's a, it's a dead-end worldview. But if you believe that we are the image of God, we're separate from creation, and creation is really just there for us to do what we like with, that's a deeply destructive worldview. And many environmentalists believe that that is what Christians think alone, and that because of that worldview, that's why we're seeing the environmental crisis today, because we have separated ourselves from nature. Well, the Bible says no. We are part of nature, but we are called apart within the community of creation. Genesis 2 emphasizes that we are made from the dust of the earth. The very name Adam comes from the Hebrew Adama. So he shouldn't be called Adam, really, if we're to understand it. He should be called Dusty. This is the story of Dusty and Eve. It's there in Genesis 1, too. We as humans, we don't even get our own day. We're made on the same day as all the other animals. We're related. We shouldn't be scared of that. God made us all. But we are called apart. We are the image of God in some special and unique way. But that special and unique, unique way is not so much about privilege as about responsibility. Responsibility to God. Responsibility to subdue and rule over the creation. And that doesn't mean exploit and destroy. The word that's used for subdue is the word of what a farmer does to an overgrown field. Digging up the weeds, making it fruitful, cutting off things that are diseased, looking after it. And in Genesis 2, God sends Adam into the garden to till and keep. Hebrew words that are well translated as serve and preserve. You know, that's what it means to be the image of God. It means to serve and preserve the non-human creation as well as our fellow humans. When we fail to do that, we fail to reflect the image of God. So, you can put it this way. This is the paradigm shift. The traditional view that many have around the world, and that sadly many Christians have had, 
is an egocentric view that puts us at the top of the pile. And notice, in most cases, it puts men above women as well. It's the same worldview. That's not the biblical worldview, but neither is the second, which is the main alternative that's out there on offer in the secular environmental world. The, the ecocentric worldview, we're just one randomly evolved species amongst millions. I want to suggest that the biblical worldview is this one, a theocentric, a God-centered worldview. God so loves the whole world. God made it very good. And he places human beings in a very special place, not bottom of the pile, but as a cornerstone. We're a cornerstone species. Some of you will know that term from uh, biology. And our role is to serve and preserve, to be servant stewards within God's creation. Not dominant stewards, but servant stewards. If you like, another way of putting it is that we are part of the community of creation. Some of you will know the theologian Richard Borkham. He's written very well on this in recent years. Psalm 104 and Job 38 and 39 say so much more, but I must move on. We live in a fallen world. That's Act 2. These pictures are taken near to my home in West London, but they could be taken almost anywhere. How we have wrecked and ruined and polluted and messed up God's world. And what we see from Genesis onwards is a breakdown in relationships, not just between us and God, but also between us and our neighbor, and also between us and the creation and God and the creation. It's significant that when Adam and Eve are thrown out of the garden, God says, cursed is the ground, Adama, because of you, Adam. Your relationship with the stuff from which you are made is now dislocated. So there is a problem in our relationship with creation. And when we sin against God, not just by forgetting to recycle, not just by polluting, by flying too much, but when we sin against God by lust and greed and corruption and all those other everyday sins that we see around the world, there are environmental consequences. Throughout the Old Testament, it's emphasized that the land can suffer. In Hosea, the land mourns because of the sin of the people. In Leviticus, the land vomits the people of Israel out into exile because they have failed to keep the covenant. And in Romans 8, creation groans with the pains like a woman about to have a baby. The earth is groaning because of human sin. Our relationship with God is damaged. And God cannot ignore sin. And in Revelation, there is a verse that's very striking that says, the time has come for destroying those who destroy the earth. A lot of people think Revelation is about God destroying the earth. Well, maybe they need to read that verse again. You can put it this way, and I, I borrowed this image from Christopher Wright, C.J.H. Wright, who many of you will know, who has written a lot on Old Testament ethics. And he uses this image of a triangle, God, human beings, and the rest of creation. And how every dimension of that relational triangle has been broken because of sin and is damaged and affected. We see it all around. But also, God's not going to leave it in that state. All of those are going to be part of the saving work of Christ, as we'll see in a minute. So let's move on to Act 3. Act 3 in the Bible is the story of Israel, which is both about a land and a people, a placed people. God chooses all of us to be placed people. In Act 17, Paul says to the people of Athens, God has chosen the places where you might live. We are not disembodied spirits. We are rooted, placed people. Wherever you live, God has called you to put down roots in that place, just as he did with the people of Israel. And we can see that as we look through these things. I mean, God continues to be involved in sustaining creation day by day. The sun didn't just happen to rise this morning. According to the Psalms, it rose because God made it rise this morning. God continues to give food to the animals. God's covenant continues with the earth. And God called Israel to model his purposes in the land of promise. So, so much of those books of the Old Testament that we find maybe a little bit dull sometimes, if we're honest, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, so much of that is actually about our relationship with the land, how we farm, 
So, I mean, Deuteronomy 22.6. If you're a farmer and you find a ground-nesting bird in the middle of your field, what should you do? Should you just plow it up and kill it and not worry about it? Well, according to that passage, you can take the eggs or the young birds for food, but you must not kill the mother bird. Why? So that your life might be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. It's a principle of sustainable use. It's okay to use the fruits of creation, to take the eggs or the young birds, but do not kill that mother bird. There's so much about sustainable farming, farming God's way in the Old Testament. Nearly all the festivals, apart from Passover, I think all the fest festivals that the, the people of Israel had were festivals about the land and how their relationship with God was deeply tied to their relationship with the land. Harvest and fruitfulness festivals. Sabbath. Sabbath for people, but Sabbath for your animals. And one year in seven, Sabbath for the land. Let the land lie fallow. Let it rest. The land is a spiritual barometer. Some of you probably know some worship songs. There have been several in the recent years based on 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will repent of their sins and return to me, then I will look down from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. It's the only time that phrase is used in Scripture. And people have taken it to mean, I will heal the nation. I'll bring the nation back to God. I'll fill the churches. I'm afraid that's taking that deeply out of context. If you read the context, where it's a prayer at the dedication of King Solomon's temple, the people have been crying out to God saying, why are our harvests failing? And God says, come back to me and I'll heal the land, the earth, the soil, the Adama, restoring what has been broken since Genesis 3. The land is a spiritual barometer. Again, I've stolen that phrase from Chris Wright. And probably the Bible passage that's spoken more to me than any other in the last 10 years is Jeremiah 29. Words to a people in exile. The people of Israel in Babylon, and all they want to do is go home, back to the promised land, and God says, no. Put down roots here. Plant gardens in the city and eat what they produce. Marry and have families. Get involved in society, in politics, in economics. Work and pray for the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have called you. That's a word our world needs to hear today, a world where we have so many refugees, so many displaced people, so many people who say, I didn't choose to come to this place, my boss made me, that disaster made me, and God says, okay, you're here now. I brought you here. Put down roots. We need to hear those words. So, thinking again of that triangle, this is a different version of it. God, people, land and creatures. And this is about being at home on earth. The Greek word oikos, from which we get the word economy and ecology, means home. This earth is our home. That old song that used to say, this earth is not my home, I'm just a passing through, I don't know where they got the idea from, but it, they didn't get it from the Bible. This earth is the home that God has chosen for us to live in. It's the land of promise, the community of creation, that wonderful Old Testament concept of shalom, of peace with God, neighbor, land, and creatures. The kingdom of God. So we move to the fourth act, the decisive act, the coming of God's Son to earth. Jesus is, I've already mentioned, he's the creator too. Everything was made by him, but more importantly, it was made for him. So what is the purpose of a hummingbird? Or here in Southeast Asia, a sunbird. What is the purpose of a dolphin? What is the purpose of coal, oil, gas? What is the purpose of a human being? One word, Jesus. They were made by and for Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1. It's a crucially important passage. And we often think the Gospels don't say much about creation care. Well, read them again. They're full of it. I love to preach at Christmas about how Jesus was born in Bethlehem and when the angels said there will be peace on earth because of this little baby in the village at Bethlehem, when those shepherds on the hill heard the words, what did they think? First century Jewish shepherds brought up on the Old Testament Peace on earth, to them that meant those visions in Isaiah and elsewhere of Shalom, the peaceful kingdom, the lion lying down with the lamb, 
the shepherd not having to worry about the wolf attacking the sheep because of this baby born in Bethlehem. Peace on earth. Jesus showed himself to be Lord over creation, rebuking the wind and the waves. One of the few miracles recorded right through the Gospels. Significant, Jesus' power as Lord of creation. And then most importantly, the cosmic consequences of Jesus' death and resurrection. When Jesus died, there was an earthquake. When he rose again, there was an earthquake. When Jesus died, the sky turned dark. Nature reacted to the death and resurrection of the one by and for whom all things were made. And through his death and resurrection, all of those broken lines that I showed before can be restored. Paul puts it in Colossians 1, all things, the Greek panta means everything, all things in heaven and on earth are reconciled to God through his death on the cross. Jesus' death is not just about me. It is, but it's not just. It ripples out to have consequences for the whole of creation. And when Jesus, God become matter, God become a carbon-based life form, when his body is risen, is raised from death, he is the first fruits of the new creation. If you're confused about what the Bible teaches about the future, about heaven, new creation, all of that, well, I am too. Join the club. The New Testament is quite confusing on it. But there are some absolutely clear things. And one is that Jesus' resurrection body is our key to understanding it. Jesus' resurrection body had continuity and discontinuity. Continuity because it was the same body. There was nothing left in the tomb. The nail marks were still there. But it was different because people struggled to recognize him as well. He could walk through locked doors. He could ascend up to heaven. So there was something different but something the same. And that's important to remember as we think about new creation. And the future is that everything is going to be once again put under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth. So in terms of a paradigm shift, sorry about the little cartoon character. It's the best that Google Images could provide, I'm afraid. We've sometimes made Jesus too small. My Jesus, my Savior. Now, I love that as a worship song. But that's not where the gospel finishes. It might be where it starts, but it's not where it finishes. My Jesus my saviour, yes, but how about this? He's got the whole world in his hands. There's another worship song that some of you will know. And it's the same Jesus. We need to both hold together the personal Jesus and the cosmic Christ. Because both are biblical. And our theology is wrong if we only emphasise one. You know, some have lost the personal Jesus in their emphasis on the co cosmic Christ. They've lost the need for conversion and repentance. We mustn't do that. But neither must we just stop with the personal Jesus, the pocket-sized Jesus. And that moves us to the final act, new creation. And these pictures were taken in West London, uh, in the same area where I showed all the mess back in Act 2. Uh, this is some of the work that Arosha, who I work with, have been involved in, in helping transform, bring signs of hope to a piece of urban wasteland in West London, where we now even find kingfishers but surely the earth will be destroyed. In my last few minutes, I want to just deal with this one because it's such an important stumbling block for many evangelical Christians. And it was for me for many, many years. I had to go on sabbatical for three months to really wrestle with the theology of this, to work it through, to think it through, to read what people were saying. We need to get rid of certain things, childhood ideas about what heaven is like that are not biblical. You know, this long-haired, white-haired old man as God sitting on a cloud somewhere. Um, that's, that's nowhere in the Bible. That's a kind of Victorian idea. We need to get away from popular fiction. I'm afraid Hal Lindsay's Late Great Planet Earth was fiction. And I'm afraid the whole Left Behind series is fiction. It's imagination based on a couple of slightly dodgy interpretations of a couple of slightly obscure verses. It's no better than that. And we need to really relegate it to the fiction shelves. If you've got it on bookstores and bookshelves in your church, be careful how you treat it. It's fiction. It's no more biblical, I would say, tackle me on this afterwards, than Harry Potter. 
Now, there's an extreme claim. Hellfire sermons, they've got quite a lot of our answer for. It was a kind of popular Victorian idea, turn or burn, come to Jesus or go to hell. And the Bible does talk about hell, but it doesn't talk about it a lot. Jesus never tried to threaten people into the kingdom. He told people what they were up to, and he told people the consequences of their sins, but I don't think that's a helpful approach. And as I've already talked about, sub-Christian Greek philosophical ideas particularly, but also sometimes they're from Eastern philosophy, of the separation of body and spirit, that we must be careful we don't entangle with the gospel, because that can be very dangerous. And there are a few difficult passages that have really got us into confusion here. 2 Peter 3, you know, that verse we sang from Amazing Grace earlier about the earth will melt away. I can't, what were the actual words? Something about that. Um, or disappear like smoke or something. Dissolve. dissolve. Dissolve like snow. I think that may be partly based on, on 2 Peter 3, because in some translations it talks about the earth dissolving or being destroyed in 2 Peter 3. We need to go back to the Greek and say, what did it really say? And the word for um, earth that's used there is actually not the word cosmos. It's not, not the word, it's not the geo word for earth. It's the word stoikeia, which means elements. And the usual meaning of that elsewhere in the New Testament is the principalities and powers. The principalities and powers of this current age are what are going to be dissolved and destroyed. And it also talks about fire destroying the earth. Hurestheni is the word that's used. But the word, again, has been mistranslated in many of our translations. The word that's actually used is a word of being laid bare by fire. And if the translators hadn't been academics, but had actually been ordinary farmers, like the people of the Bible times, they would have understood it. On the way driving here yesterday, we saw a field where there was fire. And they were burning the stubble of the rice paddy before planting the next crop. That's the word that's used. It's a farming term. It's the refiner's fire. The fire that burns away the dross, burns away the old, so that the new growth can come. There will be judgment. There will be fire. There will be transformation. Things will change drastically when Jesus returns. But it's not about the total annihilation of this creation. It's about the ground being prepared for what's new, new creation. Matthew 24 talks about this earth will pass away. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. And people sometimes take that, oh, well, we needn't worry about this earth. It's going to pass away. They never seem to think about the fact that it also says heaven will pass away. That's a bit worrying. Where else are we going to be? So you need to maybe actually look harder at what the passage says and look at the Old Testament passage it's half referring to. Jesus is actually making, he, quite often Jesus uses figurative language. And Jesus was thinking, what's the most solid thing that you can think of, the thing that's going to last forever? Well, it's heaven and earth. And heaven and earth, by the way, aren't two separate things. They're kind of two halves of one thing. But we'll come back to that. And Jesus is saying, heaven and earth, the most solid thing you can think of, even if that passed away, my words would remain. So you better trust my words, because they're solid. I sometimes use the analogy, if I said to my wife, I will love you until the rock of Gibraltar falls into the sea. Now, am I prophesying the end of the rock of Gibraltar? No, of course not. I'm just making an imaginative comparison to show my wife how long-lasting my love for her is. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing in that passage. And then the final thing I want to refer to here, and again, there's so much more we could talk about, is when the New Testament talks about new creation, new heaven, new earth, New Jerusalem. That used to get me confused. You know, after all, we live on the old one, so let's get to the new one. Well, I'm afraid I've grown up in a disposable culture where something, when it's old, you just chuck it away and you get a new one. And I've grown up in a poverty-struck language called English, which only has one word for new. Greek is more imaginative and has at least two, neos and kainos. Neos means brand new. If you're driving and you crash your car and it's a complete write-off, you have to get a new car. Neos. Maybe a Toyota Neos or a Nissan Neos, I don't know. But. And there is another word, kainos. If I'm driving my car and it has a bit of a bang, but actually they can do a pretty good job in fixing it up, 
And when it get, I get it back, it actually looks better than it did before because it's been painted and cleaned and it looks beautiful. It's a kynos car. Kynos in the New Testament has the meaning of renewed, restored, repaired, redeemed, recycled. And every time the New Testament talks about new heaven, new creation, new Jerusalem, guess which word it uses? It's always kynos. It's the language of radical renewal and transformation, not the language of destruction and replacement. Paul puts it better than I could. Romans 8. The creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. That's our vision. Not creation is a disposable thing that we can chuck away and God will give us a new one. No. Creation will be released from its bondage to decay. Paul puts it so clearly. Tom Wright interprets it this way. God will redeem the whole universe. Jesus' resurrection is the beginning of that new life, the fresh grass growing through the concrete of corruption and decay in the old world. So for us as God's church, Paul goes on to say this, and this is critical. The creation, the environment, the land, the oceans, the mountains, and the people and the animals wait in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. The children of God is the redeemed people, it's the church. Creation is waiting for the church. Now, if I said that in the circles of many of my non-Christian environmentalist friends, they would laugh and say, nice theory, but where's the church then? And that's the purpose of this gathering and these other that we're having around the world. It's so important. This is a huge missing part of the Great Commission. You know, the very first Great Commission is, of course, the one in Genesis 1, where God says, look after the earth for me, steward it, care for it, protect it, serve and preserve it. And we failed. Tom Wright again on this. The whole creation is waiting in eager longing, not just for its own redemption, its liberation from corruption and decay, but for God's children to be revealed, in other words, for the unveiling of those redeemed humans through whose stewardship creation will at last be brought back into that wise order for which it was made. God has given us such a privilege to reflect his image in helping restore his creation. And that work can't be complete until Jesus returns, but we can be involved in signs of the kingdom here and now. And that means this is about our discipleship, imaging God in creation care, living in the light of that vision of all creation restored and redeemed. It means that this is about our mission. And we'll hear more about that later today. Jesus in Mark 16's version of the Great Commission says, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Serving and preserving God's way, seeking creations freed from, from decay, these are part of mission. I'll be speaking about integral mission in a workshop this afternoon and I'll say more about that then. And this is part of worship. The context of our worship is not a few guitars and a lovely room. That's great, but that's quite small in terms of the Bible's vision of worship. We join in with the worship of the whole of creation, with those living and those who've died and are in glory, with every bird and every animal, and actually mountains, trees, and rivers worship God in their own way by doing what God designed them to do. We worship when we pray as Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer for God's kingdom to be earthed. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We too often pause after your kingdom come on earth as in heaven. Don't pause. Your kingdom come on earth as in heaven. That's a great place to pray. Worshipping God by living sustainably. Choosing to change our lifestyles is an act of worship not a pharisaical duty. So as I finish, here's a vision for the church. Jesus at the center, and three overlapping circles, church, creation, and community. Notice where Jesus is. We tend to put him in the middle of the church, but actually Jesus is bigger than that. He's there at the overlap of church, human community, and the wider creation. And it's been my experience in, in 20 years or so of working with Arosha 
that when we're working at that interface of the human community, the natural creation, and the church, that we see God at work very, very powerfully. Jesus has already gone ahead of us because it's his world. He cares for it, and he wants to see it restored and renewed. And here's my final slide. A vision from the book of Habakkuk, that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen? Amen. Amen.